Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics tonight. KCI's future still up in the air. Paul Lavota's political future down in the dumps. And Fabus v. Brownback take two plus roast and toast. But we begin by noting that this week marks the 50th anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid being signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. Signing has special significance to our area because it took place at the Truman Library in Independence with the former president in attendance. Medicare and Medicaid are still getting lots of news coverage 50 years later, often because of fears about Medicare running out of money and concerns about Missouri and Kansas refusing to expand Medicaid coverage under provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Our guest is someone who worries about these issues and much more. He's Charlie Shields, CEO of Truman Medical Centers in Kansas City and a former Missouri State Representative and State Senator. Mr. Shields, welcome to Ruckus. It's, it's great to be with you. Uh, Truman Medical Center used to be called General Hospital, right? It was. Why the name change? What's the significance? Well, if you go back in time, General Hospital back in the 70s became Truman Medical Centers, and that was a decision uh, by community leaders to do two things. One, create an academic medical center for University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and to create the safety net hospital to support the community. Sort of the hospital of last resort? Well, we don't certainly describe it that way. Uh, well, we just, for people who can't yeah. afford coverage uh, elsewhere? We're the safety net hospital in Kansas City. We what does that mean? Well, we, we allow, and as part of our agreement with the city of Kansas City and the county of Jackson County, uh, people who are below 200% of federal poverty level who lack insurance can receive services at Truman Medical Centers free of charge. And it's Truman Medical Centers, plural, right? Yes, we have two hospitals. Uh, we have the Hospital Hill campus, which most people are familiar with, and then we have on the eastern side of Kansas City, Truman Medical Centers Lakewood. So I would assume that many of the patients you deal with depend on Medicaid? So if you look at our, our, uh, our patient mix, about a third of the patients are, are Medicaid recipients at our, at our two hospitals. So we would be the largest Medicaid uh, provider in the Kansas City Metro. What happens to folks who don't have Medicaid and don't qualify under provisions of the Affordable Care Act? Well, that's where the safety net provision comes in. So we have, uh, on a typical year, about 41,000 patients uh, who are not eligible for Medicaid and don't have insurance receive care at Truman Medical Centers. Uh, we do about $140 million of uncompensated care. Uh, our two hospitals represent 12% of all the uncompensated care in the state of Missouri. So it's a big impact not just on the state, but certainly a great asset and impact on this community. Now, we often hear that any hospital has to treat someone who comes into the emergency room, but I take it in your case, you not only treat them in the emergency room, you put them in a room and give them continuing care. Well, even more than that, uh, and what you're talking about is people come through the emergency room, through MTALA, they have to be provided care and stabilized. Uh, but we do a lot more than that. So we have uh, primary care practices, we have specialty practices where we provide those same services to the population that lacks and is outside of insurance coverage. So that's what makes us different than all the other hospitals in Kansas City. Let's talk about Medicaid expansion. I mm -hmm. believe you would like to see Medicaid expanded in the state of Missouri, but the Missouri legislature refuses to do that. It's controlled by Republicans. When you ran for office and were elected, you ran and were elected as a Republican. Right. Do you understand the rationale? Yeah, I think you have, you have two issues at play here. Uh, one, from an economic standpoint, uh, I think expanding Medicaid makes perfect sense. It gets people in the coverage sooner, provides a, a lower cost method of providing care, uh, has a tremendous federal incentive in using federal money. So everybody gets that, they understand that, policymakers understand that. Uh, but there's a political challenge, and that's what policymakers and Jeff City are dealing with. We know that uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, is extremely unpopular politically uh, in the state of Missouri, and policymakers in the past have tied Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act, and that's what that's what makes it difficult for expansion to occur. In well, Missouri. you've talked about a Missouri-specific plan that yeah. you'd like to see enacted, and and hope that you could get a waiver from HHS. 
Yeah, I, I think the opportunity is there if, if uh, legislators working with the executive branch uh, could design a Missouri system and then apply to HHS for a waiver, I think you would get that waiver. I think there's a lot of incentive for HHS to provide those waivers. Uh, and you could, you could craft it, you could put an employment requirement in that, you could put a copay deductible requirement in that, you could tie it to managed care. There's a lot of possibilities out there and there's a lot of flexibility being provided as the federal government tries to get more people into coverage. Uh, but again, I think it's, it's difficult. What we tell policymakers is that, you know, whether it's Medicaid expansion, it's a Missouri specific solution, uh, we're, we're fine with any of those, but doing nothing is not an option because the system as it, as it stands now, uh, with the cuts from the federal government starting to occur in 2017 are very challenging. All right, sir, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in, appreciate your time. You bet, great to be here. That's Charlie Shields, CEO of the Truman Medical Centers. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Amy Patton is a columnist and blogger. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a columnist at the Kansas City Star. Steve Glorioso is a media and political consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. It must be a sign of the changing times that Missouri State Senator Paul Lavota of Independence announced his resignation not by holding a news conference, not by issuing a press release, but by putting a post on his Facebook page. It took only two days of public pressure following allegations of inappropriate advances by text and talk from two former college interns who worked in his office. One of the interns produced provocative messages allegedly authored by the 46-year-old lawmaker. Lavota maintains he's being wrongly accused and has done no wrong. If that's the case, Steve Glorioso, why resign? Why not stick around and fight? Well, as another married man once said, I did not have sex with that woman, Miss <laughs> Lewinsky. Uh, men lie about sex. I, I, I wouldn't have any personal experience, but I'm telling you, it is. Uh, he, he can say he's not guilty, and I'm sure he's trying to, you know, may, maybe save his marriage. He has two couple of kids, I think. So, um, yeah, he should have resigned, and, and I think it's a sign of a good sign that both Deal, the former speaker who was um, the uh, Republican and now Blavoda Democrat, have both quickly gone away. Uh, Woody, we hear a lot about Jefferson City as a place where it's an anything goes culture. And you spend a lot of time in Jeff City uh, lobbying for your clients. Uh, do you see that kind of culture in existence there? Well, look, <clears throat> you see all the gray in my hair? Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm associated in people's minds down there with two guys, John Ashcroft, uh, fundamentalist Christian and Charlie Sharp is a client of mine, fundamentalist Christian. You know, they don't come to me with this stuff. I don't hear all these rumors. It breaks in the newspaper and that's when I find out about it. Everybody else apparently knows about it. Um, I, I will say this, a couple of years ago, a, a, a preacher who works there and, and holds prayer meetings in the Capitol and so on, he got in front of a bunch of them and, and just laid them out. And this is before any of this broke and said, mm -hmm. this is all going on and it's time for you all to grow up and act like grown-ups. And, and be a better example. All the ones apparently who were guilty were very huffy about it being none of his business. Uh, I, I'll say this, there are a whole lot of people down there who are really fine people and who would never be involved in anything like this. And if you want to find out who they are, it isn't hard to find out. And if you're working for somebody like this, you need to go get a job with one of those other people because they are there. Claire McCaskill is trying to uh, set up some sort of a service where interns or others who feel they're being uh, pressured, harassed inappropriately can go and get some help. Right, but what a sad statement that is, that we actually have to take that step in this day and age where you have to set up an advocacy group to as a safe haven for women to step forward and actually have to go to this group. I mean, I think it's time that the men need to stand up and act more respectful to women. I mean, I just think when I read that, that, that she had to actually take that step, I was so saddened first of all. And second of all, I mean, how awful that he has to put his statement out on Facebook. I mean, I I'm scrolling through my status updates, finding out what my friend had for dinner, and then I have to find out that he resigns on Facebook. I mean, I just think that it's part of the juvenile atmosphere that goes along with what's going on in Jefferson City, that his statement comes out on a social media well, platform. Uh, the word in this day and age, uh, I, please withdraw that. Look, in this day and age, yeah. the next one, the one beyond that, and all the ones back to the beginning of time, this has gone on, and it is never going to stop. Well, but why is it only going on in 
in Jefferson City, Missouri is what I want to know. I mean, well, they, you know, everybody talks about the fact that these people are powerful. They are. Right. And they're away from home. They are. And there's this culture that's been uh, generated. I, that's true. Now, there's a le bunch of legislators in Topeka, Kansas. And they're away from home. And they're very powerful people. And yet you don't hear about interns coming forth. And they, they would be if this were all happening there. You would think that if something like that were happening in Topeka, they'd be lining up and saying, yeah, it's happening over here, too. But you don't hear that. Well, in well, some of the why? Kansas City Star reporting about John Deal and his resignation, yeah. there was an article quoting someone who studies such things and says this is not uncommon in state capitals. It's not just Period. Missouri. It's prevalent across the country. Well, and I think we're naive to think that it doesn't happen elsewhere. I sure. just think we have a bigger problem going on in Jeff City. Do you expect uh, Steve will be Steve Glorioso will be hearing from other interns in the near future about other legislators and their inappropriate behavior? We we could. Um, I think the universities and people who sponsor these internships will be very cautious in the future whether somebody. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. I mean, this has now been pretty well exposed, not only the individual incidences, but the, the star did a very good story He's talking about the whole culture. And one, one quick thing about the culture, I, uh, years ago, when Carter was president, I was a regional director of H -E, what was then HEW, and I had to go to the four capitals in the state, Lincoln and Des Moines, Kansas City, I mean Jeff City and, and uh, Topeka. And there have been studies to show that capitals in cities, in major cities in a state, have a different atmosphere than when they're in the middle of a state away from all where people, everyone has to spend the night virtually except for a handful of people. And that may be the difference between Topeka, where Johnson well, they, County people come well, home at night, don't they? No, actually not. Steve. Oh, I then mean, you better people, watch them. People go to Topeka, <laughs> spend the night, get apartments, yeah. and stay and stay in apartments. Then wait, the shoe yeah. will fall. <laughs> yeah. So is this, Steve Glorioso, from your perspective as a political consultant, is this the end of the road for Mr. Lavota? Is there any oh. chance he could resurrect his career? No, in there's, there's not. No, he. I mean, he's been he been running forever. I can't even remember when Lavota wasn't in office. A Lavota, one of the brothers yeah. in him, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, any kind of litigation that he might pursue or that the interns might pursue against him that you're aware of, Woody? Well, it's it, it's certainly possible that the interns could could do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it, I'm not sure, you know, they've, they've solved their problem. If I were they, I would feel yeah. this is over with. I, this guy's out of office. I've done something meaningful about right. this, and right. that's enough. All right. Make over or start over? That's a question Kansas Cityans have been considering for the past year or two. Should KCI be renovated, or should the present structures be torn down and a new one-terminal facility be created? While we won't likely know an answer until sometime next year, it now seems the decision will be to start over, build a brand new facility. Driving this thinking is a report from Southwest Airlines, KCI's biggest tenant, saying it would actually cost more to renovate the airport than to rebuild it. Do you think Kansas Cityans could become comfortable with a new and a different KCI? Amy, let's start with you. Well, I travel a lot for business, so I'm in and out of our airport frequently, and I agree that it's very, very convenient, but I think it's time. I think it's time for a one-terminal airport, and I know it's not the popular opinion right now, but I think the big guy has spoken, which is Southwest, and I think we're in a great position where we can build the one-terminal airport, continue to use our existing airport, but I think it's a great idea to have everybody in one place. Security is going to be better with everything in one place. And I think that in time, Kansas City doesn't like change, but we've had the change, the revitalization of our downtown um, Kansas City. And I think we're going to get used to a one terminal airport. And I think it's the only way to go. Do you find it counterintuitive that it costs more to build a, yes. or to refurbish the old one <laughs> than to build a new one? Yes, <laughs> yes I, I do. I do. And it may cost more. But again, I think as the city grows, we have to look to the future. And I think a one terminal airport is going to be great. I wish in the plan, though, they'd move that airport into Kansas City about 10 miles, um, but I don't think they asked me about Steve, including you, that to the plan. If I remember correctly from your previous columns and appearances yeah, on, on the show. program, yeah, yeah, show, you, yeah, you don't like to see the idea of KCI being changed come to the Well, forefront. of course, I, I had certain facts that I was making my judgment on at the time, and that was I, I thought, well, I, it's still a fact that KCI is one of the most convenient airports in North America, and that's a fact by studies, not just by me saying it. Now things have changed in terms of the cost and what Southwest Airlines has to say, and it's caused me to have second thoughts. 
Because, uh, first of all, now what we know is it's going to cost more, at least they think it will, that it will cost more to uh, uh, renovate than it will to build a, a new airport, which, which was an astonishing fact. And, and the other thing is the Southwest Airlines, which controls 40% of the flights out of KCI, says, by God, we want a single airport. Well, you don't screw around with Southwest Airlines. If that's what they say they want, then you have to pretty much go with what they want. Otherwise, we're going to wake up one day and find out we're like Oklahoma City and we've right. shrunk because Southwest Airlines is the hub, is a virtual right. hub right. in Kansas City. Other Steve, uh, what are they going to change at KCI? What are some of the changes being contemplated? Well, real quickly to the renovation, it doesn't surprise me that you have to renovate three terminals would cost more than building one new terminal. I mean, I, it didn't. Well, the initial studies, the I, initial studies right. said it was going to be the opposite. Right. It was supposed to cost 1.2 billion for a new and less. But the, the fact is, is, the airlines will pay for it and they'll pass it through, and a very yeah. it will be minuscule. But, but what, what's going to change? Well, I, it, well, you 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 won't be able to drive up to within 25 feet of, of a gate or a ticket window. But they can design an airport of a single terminal where they can move people very quickly and relatively conveniently. But I think one of the things, and it was alluded to on a radio show recently, uh, KCUR with Steve Kraske's show, the security is stunningly inadequate. Now? Uh, right. I can drive, I, this dawned on me the other day, waiting for a bag, 35 minutes. Uh, you can drive, you could drive, <coughs> Timothy McVeigh could drive that same truck up to gate 92 at the airport mm -hmm. and destroy three airplanes that are 72 feet, that was my measurement, from the curb to the nose of a con uh, United Airlines. I mean, I don't know that they're willing to say that out loud, but I think we're incredibly vulnerable to t that type of an attack. Agreed. And it's just the facts of the world we live in today. And Woody, the final decision, however, will be made by the voters of Kansas City, Missouri. Is that not right? I, I believe so. And look, if they get Southwest Airlines uh, position is probably a game changer on this uh, for the I think for the voters. Um, but uh, what I'd like to focus on is if it is true that it was the original estimates half a billion dollars to renovate mm -hmm. a billion two to build. Let's just take those numbers. <clears throat> well, a half a billion dollars, really? And they had all these pictures of the place falling apart down underneath. What we are about to do is once again reward bad management. Uh, public entities do not maintain roads, sewers, bridges, buildings. They let them go to hell and then they come tell you you've got to do something about it. Uh, there should be a sinking fund. We know that in another 40 years we're going to have to replace it. We know in 20 years we're going to have to rehab it. Where's the sinking fund in this plan that, that does that maintenance as we go on so that we're not faced with this kind of Hobson's choice? The answer is there won't be one, and we may all be in the grave, but they'll go through the same thing again. If this is done, it will be built on the <coughs> site of Terminal A, and so the this operations of the airport yeah, right. could continue while the construction is taking place. KCI was dedicated in 1972, I believe, and the speaker, do you know who the speaker was at the opening ceremony? Charlie Wheeler. No, no. it was the <laughs> vice president of the United States, oh, Spiro T. Agnew. Yeah. Yes. Well, that explains my well, friend, the report lasted longer than he did. <laughs> my friend Steve Rose began his most recent column by saying, my friend Mike Shannon, who moderates the KCPT program Ruckus set on air, that my recent contention that Orville Faubus would feel at home in Kansas was outrageous. Not so, Mike, end of quote. Orville Faubus was a segregationist governor in Arkansas in the late 1950s who tried but failed to resist the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board of Education. Faubus, by the way, was a Democrat. When the issue was discussed before on this program, Steve was not on the panel. Obviously, he is this time. So, Steve, tell us how you reached the judgment that Faubus would feel right at home in the state of Kansas. What Orville Faubus was is one of the great court defiers of all time in American history. What we have going on in Kansas right now is a series of court defiers who are telling us that the courts do not have the authority to do what the courts have always had the authority to do. I'll cite you the four quick examples. One, school funding. It has been the Speaker of the House, Ray Merrick, has said if the Supreme Court decides we need more school funding, the, the legislature just may not go along with it. On block grants to schools, 
A three-judge panel has determined that they're unconstitutional. That's going to go to the Supreme Court. And the legislators have already started to animate that the power of the purse belongs in the legislature, not the courts. On district court chief judges, uh, the, the legislators have said if they, that is found to be unconstitutional, they will defund the courts. They will not fund the judges, nor the computers, nor the clerks, nor anything. And then there's the gay marriage executive order about the religious exceptions, and I cited it in my column about adoption and how that it could affect adoption. This whole thing draws a, a, a major, horribly frightening pattern of, of a legislature and a governor who would dare to say to the highest court in our state, or, or in the land, in, in some cases here, uh, that they don't have to pay attention to what the court orders. And I think that's, uh, it, that is a frightening scenario, and nobody knows what the outcome will be when there's that kind of a crisis, and the crisis is coming. Now, may I offer a brief rebuttal? You may have a brief rebuttal. We know, <laughs> we know what Orville Faubus did. We have no idea what Sam Brownback or the Kansas legislature will do on any of the issues you cite. What you're talking about is purely speculation on your part. Is that not true? Can you cite any example of Brownback defying a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court or the state Supreme Court? No. I have four threats, threats. from the legislature and the governor saying that they will not abide right. by the it, court's It's rulings. one thing for Ray Merrick to make a statement about what the legislature may do and what, in fact, will happen. But as I said, there's no evidence any of this is going to come to fruition. That's just speculation. That's what you think might happen. Well, I've learned from all my years on ruckus never to argue with the moderator. <laughs> well, no, that's why. <laughs> but you can see why I was, well. <laughs> I was concerned about your, uh, your column. And, and people think of Fabus as a segregationist. Would you not agree? They don't generally that's say, not, that oh, he defied to, that, the, Yes, that has uh, nothing to do with what I'm They, they don't about. worry about constitutional rulings and those nuances. They think of him as a segregationist who blocked the, the school door in Little Rock. Is that fair to analogize Faubus to Sam Brownback or any legislator in Kansas? Well, yes. It because, is? Because what, Faubus what defied... Well, because it was, <coughs> segregation was the issue. But Faubus defied the Supreme Court of the United States and said, we in Arkansas have a sovereign, as a sovereign state, yeah. he said this, have the well, right to defy the orders of the Supreme but, Court. But Brownback has yet to defy any order from the U.S. or the state Supreme he Court. He hasn't even said he's going to defy the Supreme no. Court. But Faubus did not defy the Supreme Court. He f defied a United States District Court that issued an order to the state of Arkansas or the school board or some arm of the state of Arkansas. There's no order to the state of Kansas. That case is a precedent. It's not an order. So. Faubus had an order to him, you will do this, and he but, called out the military to keep from doing it, this being, let those kids into that school. There's no similarity. We always test Supreme Court cases. Every time the Missouri legislature meets, they start testing the limits of Roe versus Wade. We've been doing it ever since Roe versus Wade was handed down, and a lot of times we've been upheld. The branches of government are all independent, not just the judiciary. They are independent of one another. I'll tell you who'd be comfortable in Kansas if he were actually defying the Supreme Court, which he's not. If he did that, people comfortable in Kansas would be Andrew Jackson, who took Supreme Court orders and threw them in the wastebasket. Abraham Lincoln, who took federal court orders, including one Supreme Court order, and threw them in the wastebasket. Franklin Roosevelt, who, who beat the court into submission, would be very comfortable with it. And the guy in the White House right now, who is testing the limits of a whole bunch of federal court decisions at this moment, would be very comfortable there, too, if Brownback were defying the court, which he is not. But, but the court order in Arkansas stemmed from the Brown from, v. Board but that's of Brown, Education ruling. Brown yeah, is but, the precedent. The yeah. order you defy but is I, I the think, one that I think, to Steve, it's going to be unlikely that there will be any defying of the U.S. Supreme Court or the state it's Supreme Court in Kansas. It's just going to test the All right, it is time now for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads cheer or jeer people and events in the news. And we start with Amy. All right. I <laughs> am going to roast the very... Um, the lion story oh, that is Cecil. currently, yeah, Cecil the lion, um, the dentist who went and uh, killed the lion. Um, I am obviously very disappointed in the tragedy that happened with the lion, but I am more disappointed in the people that have gone to social media and have outed him by phone number, address, business. 
Um, I think it's one thing to obviously commit the, the crime, if you, I think it is a crime, of what he did, but all the people that are jumping on board the bandwagon to out where he lives and his phone number, I think that's just terrible what we're doing um, to him. Um, let it play out um, legally to find out if he did commit a crime and back off people um, as far as putting out his personal information. Woody. Uh, it has been estimated that this year, for the first time since the sixth year of the Bush presidency, uh, the growth in national health care costs to all of us, the government and private citizens, is going to go up in excess of 5 percent, by 5.5 percent. The principal thing Obamacare was supposed to accomplish was to stop that, and instead it's getting worse. So there it is, Obamacare, hurting you and hurting America. My friend Steve Rose. I'd like to toast in advance the Johnson County Commission, who is four, at least four members are going to dare to pass a tax increase. Can you hear that? A tax increase for parks and libraries and transit in Johnson County. In this day and age, they get gold medals for courage. Steve. I'd like to roast the people that keep denying that black Americans have not been targeted uh, by police, a very small minority, but it happens over and, and it's now becoming more obvious as we have body cameras, cell phone cameras, just yesterday or this week that poor black kid that was murdered by a police officer. And you know, I, 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 these talking heads on Fox News that are just epitomize racism always try to pick everything apart. Well, the kid should never have started to roll forward. The fact of the matter is blacks are being targeted by some police men and women. All right, and that is Ruckers for this week. We're back next Thursday evening at 7. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.